Andres Jones. Andras, thank you. Toy Newkirk. Sure, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> but well, this, this actually goes to make my point. 
I was very, I, I, was, I was just a pup. I was 19 years old. I don't even, I was barely past the age of consent. This woman had her way with me. I think you consented just fine. <laughs> <laughs> you got me there. Enthusiastic consent. It was enthusiastic consent. Absolutely. God, I wish Tuesday casted me. <laughs> it's not a euphemism, boy. It's actually casted me. She's like, I need a toy. It's a what? No. Like the whole makeup, put the hair up, do everything, wear glasses, da 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 da, and I just kind of drowned out by my, myself, my sparkle, and they're like, good, you got the job. I was like, what? Oh, you still sparkle. <laughs> <laughs> and that was it, I got the job, and um, Randy put us all together. Yeah. 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 Yeah, um, for me it was also just a, it was an audition. I just got the audition and, and went in and I um, I read for Annette, the casting director, and then after that I read with Renny and um, he basically, I mean after we had done the scene a couple times, he just basically hired me on the spot, which was really amazing. And um, then that was it and then I got the role and then I walked outside of New Line Cinema and then I was so excited that I got it, I tripped down like two flights of stairs <laughs> and somebody picked me up at the bottom and I was still like so happy that I was bleeding, but it was okay. <laughs> it was okay. Could any of you speak about um, like what you knew about the Elm Street franchise going into this or you know where, where it's drawn from there or were you expecting it to go to that point while you were on set making the film? To be honest, like, we had no idea that it was going to blow up like that. No, no way. No way. No. To be honest, like, uh, this isn't true, but this one guy said to me, he goes, back then doing horror films was one step from doing porn. Yeah. They were, like, <laughs> they were like, you got a horror film? You know, there were, just, there were like three channels and like, so we had, nobody had no idea. And especially like porn and porn. So it's perfect for me. Good answer. No, really, I always loved horror films since I was little. You know, little. You know, small grass number. <laughs> but especially the way when we first, like when we got the script and then the writers went on strike and then we had 40 days to film an entire movie in a in a warehouse that was out in Valencia in the middle of a desert and we had like kind of half walls up and you hear everyone else doing their scenes and be like, action, shh, quiet, all right, toy, go. And I'm like, wait, wait. And so it just didn't feel like we were really doing a big movie, but yet there was something intrinsically, like there was an energy that I think we all felt like, oh wow, you know what, we're doing something cool. If no one else knows about it, right. we're hustling our ass off in this little 40 day period, and there was special effects, and the creative teams, and we all just felt like a part of that motion. And, and, and I think also, Rennie was a good part of it too, because of direction and yes. stuff like that, you know, with everybody. I think he added a lot. But by putting this all together, I think he really came up with something good. Yeah. Could also, also oh, go ahead. No, no, no. Okay. I was gonna say also, I, you know, I've said this other thing, but I think that in a part the fact that Rennie was new to the country and English was not his first language meant that he gave us a lot of latitude. He would trust us, especially because he didn't have writers to go to to say, oh they, this thing isn't working. You guys want to try and do something that's different with it. So we got to be much more creative. It was a weird first experience for a big film that you think, oh, they're always going to want me to rewrite my scenes. Right. That's a total difference. <laughs> that is so, a total difference. Because I worked on Murder, She Wrote, which was like a very successful show. Where I was five years old. So my point is, that when you got there, they were like, hey, kid, hey, kid. And I was like, hey, kid, like, these, are, you know, these are established. You do not change the script. You hit your marks, and you, you and then get out. Or you're <laughs> fired. <laughs> or you're fucking, you're out. You're, you're done. You're not. And so that you know, coming from like a Burbank Studios, you know, Angela Lansbury, hit your marks, kid. Do it right and save the life exactly like it's in the script. And then we go to Nightmare on Elm Street. We're like, hey, you know, just, how do you guys feel about this? Yeah. You want to say that or does that work for you? Let's well, let's how about I say this? this? I'm like, okay, cool. Run with that. You know. And so it was a big difference. <laughs> and and in uh, Variety magazine, Robert told me about this. It's um, it's a picture of him holding my head and in a tuxedo. And we were sort of like a joke at the end of the We're sort of like a team, you know, horror movie, blah blah blah, and kind of looking down at us. Apparently, he's made so much money. <laughs> we 
took out this big added variety, not we, I mean, you know, the company line, uh, took out big, and with the amount of money that we had made, and suddenly the industry went, oh, wait a minute, hold the phone here. Um, so we, we really went from this, you know, feed, car, blah, blah, to like up here right. in terms of um, respect. Absolutely. We put new line on me, I'm not going to, but you did. Yeah. New line goes. Lord of the Rings, thank us. <laughs> <laughs> well, speaking of Lenny, what was his, the directing style that you guys were with, he was letting you kind of read new characters and things like that, um, but was, you know, were you getting a lot of character, were you getting a lot of on-set notes, or was it just kind of do your thing, we trust you? Do your thing, we trust you, and there's a lot of latitude and a lot of trust, so when you have that kind of trust, creativity, with your creative juices, you feel safe on a set, like you were talking about, you know, it feels like you're just like, I just better be a really good little girl, but, you know, um, but on the set, it was like, we really were trying to work together to create something amazing, like, I remember in the diner scene, there's, uh, so I'm like, you know, Al the waitress, and I'm finding some work to do, some things to do, you know, what would I do, and I'm like, oh, I'm with polishing silverware, and there's this amazing shadow happening on the wall, and I'm like, ready, ready, come look at this shadow, and I was holding forks, and I'm like, it looks like a glove, he grabs the knives, Use the knives. Well, Tuesday knows how to do any Oh, Lisa, you look so good today. Take the knives off. <laughs> so I'm holding knives. So that like little shot insert was just kind of happened because we felt free artistically, you know. And so it was a, just a great experience. And now that we've all had numerous acting experiences with other kinds of sets, other kinds of directors, yeah, Brandy was awesome. It really was. Yeah. What did you think about that? Uh, well, it's like I said, it was it was the it was a wonderful absence of direction, which allowed <laughs> us to be. But no, no, I mean, because he's he's a very visual director, and there, the the that film is before CGI, and the amount of special effects, as you said, we had three or four sets going out at one time. Like we'd have the scene. I what I remember is the scene where. Ken Sagos flies out of the window, he's laying on the bed, and that is a, a room built onto the wall, and there's someone chained into a chair, and then they fall down through the window. In the box, and, and you had that built on one thing, and then you have Rodney's uh, uh, waterbed thing in another place, and he's running around having to, like his, he doesn't speak English very well, it's his first big budget film, he's running around basically making four movies at once. We have the, the <laughs> the first unit and the second unit shooting, and so we just didn't have time, or necessarily, I don't know, it's like the inclination to work with actors, and, but he was, I, either he got, either he had great instincts or he was very, he made some great choices, and that he put together a bunch of people who I think all brought the best out of each other, and so we just, you know, it, there was a kind of kismet to our chemistry for ourselves that he, that he was able to trust. So, I mean, there, you, you, your dog, and you're bringing me out because you know Renny and I butted heads a little bit. I'm bringing you out. It was a it was a different time in Hollywood, and uh, and he, yeah, he just he was definitely a, he was kind of a macho guy, and I uh, I'm not, and I you know so yeah so we had all, all, but at the same time, and that's going to be on every set. There's all kinds of stuff, but the, the proof is in the pudding, and this was this turned into an amazing amazing thing. So you know. No, I, I mean, just because he yada 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 got, got in my story about my dad at that one thing. I don't know, I oh, oh, sorry. Sorry, inside baseball. Sorry. Well, I, I have didn't to any laugh at all. <laughs> Thanks, Tuesday. I'm sorry. Each of the nightmare films um, feels a little bit more tonally different from the one before. Whereas the first one is really dark and raw and visceral. They they seem to be getting a little bit more um, comedic as they're going along. Did you get any feeling of that on set? Like, were you given any sense of that? Oh, yeah, definitely. Robert Robert became uh, the, <laughs> the star. The star. You know yeah, what I mean? Yeah. He was the star. We were yeah. We're like the side. We're the new brats that are going to get killed. Basically, or, you know, we're talking about something. So, but but Robert was the star, and like you said, the first movie was dark and saw him like bitch, bitch, and like no, you didn't see him. It was like the shadows all the time. That's all you were thinking for. He's doing. He says he has sunglasses on. He feels too big in the daylight. <laughs> like, there's like, they're, they're, but 
Like a horror film. When do you ever see a horror film that takes place on a beach in broad daylight right. with Robert putting on Ray Bans? But and yeah. just yeah. Yeah. And then you got some great rock and eighties music. Right. Woo! It's hard. Yeah, yeah, the movie theater, so. and yeah, the and also the MTV uh Rob Rollins called the MTV Nightmare on Street. It's true. I'll, I'll take that. I, I also like toys uh, where he's in with toy in the school in the school room where he's like peeling the apple well, that's with his legs. You know, as I was going to say, that was that was actually Robert. You know, and again, we're on strike and Renny was new, but Robert kind of looked at me and he's like, "All right, how are we going to play this one out?" And I was like, oh, "I don't really know. What do you want to do?" And he's just like, "Well, a teacher has an apple." A student gives the teacher an apple. And I was like, okay. He's like, give me an apple. And he came over and gave an apple. And he just threw his feet up. And that moment really, for me, set me into, oh god, this guy's really creepy. <laughs> I'm a little scared right now. And then it just gave us that, again, momentum just to be and go with him. And I, for myself, I trusted Robert more than anyone, only because by that point I had learned that he was you know, a true thespian in my eyes, which is doing great Shakespearean work, and I was going to high school for the arts, I just graduated, and so we were studying Shakespeare, and so he was a god to me. And so I didn't really see a director or was interacting with Freddie that much, but I interacted with Robert so much that he was just a giving. He would give everything he could in that scene, not for him to shine, but for us to shine, and that, as an actress, I was just like, wow, that's really good. Um, um, one thing, when I was booked for four, I was like, really? <laughs> Did you see three? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, your head. So, Not often. No. So, it was like the first day on the set, and I was standing next to Robert, and we were waiting to you know, start a scene. And I said, okay, 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 okay. So, you cut my hair off, right? And he said, yeah. I said, that's right. And he said, so, uh, why am I here? And he said, Brooke. And I said, why? And he said, shut up. And I said, I <laughs> Now, did you see differences on set between Robert and him and his Freddie makeup? Like, was there a preparation process in there? Or was it just always super sweet Robert? That's a great question. It is a good question. I, I, are you talking about the difference between the way he looked in the actual movies? No, no there, like, um, was there a getting into character process? Like, did uh, you see him slowly become I'm kind of a toy. Like, honestly, Robert was like this. He had like a glow around him all the time. You know, what I mean? he's like he's such a. I mean, we were new actors, and he's a seasoned actor, so like, I, I didn't get any difference. I just got a toy guy, like a guy that was really trying to always be I good actors. And I spent a lot of time on him too. He was he was a really gracious guy on set. He, he was. Go ahead. He wasn't someone to cook. No, I don't know. You have to ask him if he changed. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like maybe because. He's not the kind of guy who would go, all right, kids, be quiet. I need to get into my character now. <laughs> Bitch, you know, you know, suck up like that. He was nothing like that. I mean, we were in the makeup trailer, and he's getting his you know, face on, and I'm getting my red rinse put on my hair and blow dry and stuff. And we're just sitting there in the makeup trailer, you know, we're talking about he was redoing the bathroom. We're talking about tile and grout colors, you know. <laughs> So, like, he, he just really, I mean, I think he was a trained enough actor that, you know, he, he already worked on his character. He knew what he was going to do. He could turn it on like that. Yeah. Yeah. So, that's my take and my experience with Well, I guess, when you've seen my death scene, I feel like he was very different in my death scene than he was in pretty much any other. He was. He was invisible. I know. He gave, he's such a generous actor. He just disappeared and allowed me to have that moment. So, so you guys in the room, room, he's joking. You guys know that they, they, yeah. they, they ran out of money and they had to like he had to make his own scene up without <laughs> I, like that. I like that scene. Really funny. I think that seems really cool actually. I, I love it. it. I love it. I had so much fun. I, I mean you... I miss I am it was if it weren't for these cons where I'm the only one who doesn't have a great picture with Robert, I would never even have been thought about. It. I because I he was there. He was like Freddie was in the room. It was very well. You were very good in that scene, and I thought that you did a great job. And I think that it was done oh, well. You. When we did the scene where he has to take my head off, we actually used real, they were real razors because they wanted to take have 
with one shot where he goes in, takes up my head and then rips up the pillows, and he can't rip up pillows with pretend razors. So he was so careful, because I am also a klutz, so he was so careful, he would really choreograph the whole thing, and I could take my, my head back and swish like that and then bring you know, the other head forward. But they, they were the real deal, and it was like, wow. Wow. Yeah, I'm going, wow. That's oh. very interesting. Yeah, I'm yeah. not yeah. totally trusting. I mean, did you guys do some of your own stunt work, or were there some people on set, or was this kind of just a, oh. we're going to do it? Oh, oh, no. Well, I knew a little gymnastics, so I could, so like, in the church and the nun shops and all that, they sent me to, what, we had a half a day of karate school on dress, Yeah. So we could learn some karate, and then, uh, <laughs> and then I could do start the flip and do the cartwheel into, but then it went into, we had a lip pad. <laughs> One day there were like four or five houses running around in the leather jacket and the jeans who were doing all that amazing work in the church scene and the flips and this and that. I mean, they were true gymnasts. Um, it, was, it was amazing. They made me look fucking good. <laughs> I mean, it makes you wonder when Cirque du Soleil is going to do a Nightmare on Elm Street. <laughs> That's right. Your character would totally be the star of that thing. Did you get on there? So could you each, um, Nightmare has become so iconic for the death scenes, like that's what we remember from a lot of the films is, oh, this is the one with this particular scene or this particular scene. Could you each talk about working um, with the effects in your own particular scene and, and how it was kind of constructed together? Lisa kicks his ass, who didn't die? Yeah, Lisa doesn't die. Which I used to bemoan, I'm like, I never got my best name with Robert England. <laughs> and then one day at Life Falls and I went, like, You know, it was interesting because they had us, um, at least for me, they're like, before you start filming, you're going to go to special events. And I was like, okay, cool, well, that's great, let's do that. And they're like, start at the Vespa school, and you're going to learn how to drive a Vespa. And I was like, oh, cool, and I really did. Like, there's gears in the Vespa, in the old school Vespa. And I was like, okay, that's awesome. I thought that was it. And then they sent me the next day, and Nick Strawn, who was wonderful, and his sister, CJ, um, they actually were, you know, ran my death scene. And I was with them for like two to three weeks. So I actually spent more time in the special effects department than I did filming on set, which was really strange. And they kind of stuck my hands in these molds and they put a mold and cast over my body and I couldn't breathe. And they put little straws in my nose and off the side, and they're like, just sit there for 30 minutes and let it dry. And suddenly I was like, I'm gonna die in here, and they won't care. And they're like, no, 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 just don't move, because once you move, then we'll have to do it over again. So then they take the saw, they, they take it off the back of my head, and so when we actually go in to film the scene, Robert's looking at the doll, which I wish I would have kept. Because uh, I offer it to be. But he's looking, he's like, all right, your mouth is wide open, so just open your mouth and I'm going to come in. I was just like, no, wait, wait, wait. I wish I would have done that all over again, because I would have had my mouth wide open. Um, and his dentures fell completely in my mouth. <laughs> but that was fun. No, but I had a great time. That's a special effect. <laughs> yes. Yes, it's after lunch, and there was Robert's dentures. Big teeth. He has big teeth. Yeah. The Freddy, Robert doesn't have dentures. Oh, the Freddy's. Freddy's dentures. It's a new movie. Freddy's dentures. Yeah. Correct. So I had a great time in special effects. Me too. I'm with Toy. Like, well, when you do like regular movies, you don't, or regular even series, like, there's not a lot of like effects. You don't get like wounds or like, you know. But well, nightmare. I did. I had so many body casts in that movie. I, I was like, I always laugh. Like, you guys remember body casts? Everyone did. Like, everyone did. I did like a, I did, like, a I did, like, that head piece, an eye patch, like, a car crash, and then the next movie, the whole my death scene was just out of control. But yeah, I did probably like more effects than half the actors that I know. They could, and what's it called? There was a technique. Like, even they use it in Thriller when they make the cast of you and then pour this goo over you, and you have to let it sit all. Well, that was a really like hot technique then, so everyone like they were just so excited to do it. Like, well, everybody like, oh, what's your scene? It has nothing to do with it, but they had like a gas. <laughs> Whatever. And then it, man, it's a crazy process. And then when you see it, it's actually you. It's like a real picture of you. It's wild. 
Yeah. It's like a sculpture of your name. Here you are. Well, we already talked about my, uh, the only, the, I mean, the only two real special effects in my death scene. One, Steve Fearberg, who shot the film, and basically was like the, I mean, since I was doing the scene basically alone, he, I was working with him, and a lot of the stuff where we were fighting, he was dancing with me, and so there were the camera moves there. But then the only other real special effect in my scene was acting. <laughs> <laughs> and a fine job you did. What happened? I don't know. <laughs> I feel like I really like you today. <laughs> um, my death scene was sort of, um, I don't know, it was like when Robert was getting his makeup on because I was burned in the furnace. And they were doing um, my makeup and it was very much like his. Um, it took hours and hours and hours and uh, I don't know. Yeah. It was quite bad. Yeah. Um, and it was, it was, it was interesting. Was interesting. I only had, I didn't have any body cast done, but uh, there's Al, old Alice in four, right? And turning into old Alice. So they tried to put three different kinds of old age makeup on me, which took up several hours. But originally, um, my mom was going to play like a lot like my mom, and she was going to play old Alice. But yeah, I know. But the timing didn't work out because she had just gotten married to her second husband and was in a honeymoon in Hawaii, so she wasn't available. So anyway, there's my story about old Alice. <laughs> so after the film comes out, it releases, did you suddenly, and it did incredibly well, the ad variety and everything, did you suddenly discover that you were getting a whole new fan base or that your roles you were getting were changed based off the film? I wish that was the case. Yeah. This is before social media. We were waiting for you. Yeah. We've been waiting for you all these years. Yeah. You had to grow up. Yeah. We got fan mail. We get the old school fan mail. If I had your agent was, we get lots of fan mail, but there was no such thing as social media at the so, right. time. It was really hard for people to yeah. even like, back the, when it went. The movie was number one competing with the blockbuster movies. Yeah. 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 We Stayed there for, yeah, like like there for, six old, weeks. for like a good yeah. three years, right? And, uh, but that, yeah. and that's what, what uh, Brooke was talking about. They didn't make what Nightmare on Street franchise a legitimate like deal because now they the studio work by them. Like, well, this is a big problem. They're usually, they make a lot of money. But um, back then, we had there was you, you still could like look up people's phone numbers. You know, so I had a phone number that you could look up because like, I wasn't bad at a couple commercials. And play. So yeah, my phone. Is, we love you, we're in North Carolina, you're in that movie football, dude. I'm like, oh my god. Actually, no, yeah. But they didn't really know me. They were like, hey, football guy, dude, you're in the movie. I was like, all right, cool. So people will watch it. And we actually all went to the movies together. I was going to say that. Oh that man, what a blast. That was like being part of the Beatles or something. We were like, holy crap. It was like, you know. I think that's when I figured out, wow, there's something here. Um, was that we. There was lines. There was an opening to the movie and we actually went to the theater, I think in Westwood, and we all met up and some of us wore a Nightmare on Street jacket, names on it, we just thought whatever, we would watch our movie. And all of a sudden it was just like thunderous and people would laugh or cry or screech and ear and at the end we, we got mobbed in this way where we were like, we had no idea and it was exciting and we were friends by then and hanging out and like Tuesday and I, we're just, I was her little shadow. Everywhere she was, I was. Even if I wasn't filming. Like, we, I know, we, were to, we still would go out every day. Every, every day. If you were working, I would. We, we yeah, and if you were working at General Hospital, I'd be like, yeah, I'm not working right now. I'm going to come over and see you. So I'm sorry. Upset. I don't know how I want it. <laughs> we were like fast friends. So it was good. It was good times. It was really good times, actually. Yeah, they definitely opened up some audition opportunities. For sure, like Walter Hill, who for the aliens, they got to audition for him, and then I can't remember. The, and then the actor, oh, he's got a, quite the reputation. He did Nine and a Half Weeks, was one of his first movies. Mickey Rourke. Thank you, Mickey Rourke. I got to do a screen test with Mickey Rourke. That was really interesting. So anyway, yeah. Is dentures fall in your mouth? <laughs> what did you say? No, no, he was two and a half hours late. Oh. Instead of nine and a half weeks. He, he didn't get the dentures until later. Yes. I mean, the only thing I remember is just that in Hollywood, it didn't make, it felt like it made very, very little difference at the time. But if you were in a mall, 
and you were in, if you were walking through the mall and you walked past the video arcade, people would be like, oh my god. That's like, are you, are you the guy from Nightmare on Elm Street? I mean, they, oh my god, are you the guy from Nightmare on Elm Street? Because their voices haven't changed yet. But, and then, like I said, it really, I really did have this sense of like, I, I hope some of those kids grow up to be directors and they don't work again. I'm still waiting for you. I didn't get recognized because I went back to blonde hair and no one recognized me. They were like, oh, you can't be Alice. You're too good looking. <laughs> I actually looked more after that. After that fact, I started booking a lot of different worlds, a lot of grainy roles. And I was like, I take them. That sounds great. That's awesome. I started working um, nonstop. I think my agent. Was that you? Were you my agent at the time? I was your agent later. Later, after that. She's like, when you weren't working, I was your agent. <laughs> Wait, and you gotta tell them, you were there, was, you were there for a very historic Pepsi Cola shoot. Oh, the Michael Jackson shoot? Yeah. Yes. The one where he yes. caught on fire. Oh, wow. Yes, we had just met like uh, five hours before. He's actually a great guy. I mean, I'm a girl, so I mean, he's wonderful. <laughs> throughout the uh, Shrine Auditorium, and um, he went up on the play, and I just remember crying because <laughs> I thought that he was my best friend at that point. Oh. So I just thought I had lost my best friend. But, oh. uh, yeah, no, he was a, he was a good guy. Mm -hmm. yeah. We put him out. Well, no, he was never really okay after that, because I think from that point on, he was forever in pain, and thus oh my God. The, the being on pain pills and always trying to manage something that was a unmanageable. I believe, but I don't know why. <laughs> well, uh, there's, a, there's, a there's, a, there's a whole rabbit hole. If you, as your followers of films, do you ever notice like different like uh, parallels between different people's roles? Like you see an actor in a film and they're like, wow, they're always, you know, they're always on a boat. Or they're all, and like, you, uh, well, I think of like the, I can't, I can't help but separate or connect the idea of Robert with his burned face and Michael Jackson with his burned hair with you. And I'm wondering, are there other, are there other burned situations in your, in your films? Yeah, there's a lot of men out there. A lot of men burning. <laughs> so we're going to open it up to audience questions. Let's Because um, she's great. Oh, the question was, how did your song get to the film? How did it happen? Um, well, um, I knew they were looking for music uh, for the movie, and I asked Rennie if he would be um, willing to listen to something that I wrote or started to write, and um, he said yes. So when I found out it was a yes, I that day I wasn't working, so that day I went and went into a studio and with my writing partner at the time, and. We wrote it in, in like six, five hours. Uh, did the whole thing, recorded it, um, and then I brought it back to him at the end of the day. And I played it for him in my car. I put the doors out, let the speakers wail, and uh, and he just flipped out over it. And I was just ecstatic because he loved it, and he said he was going to use it. And I didn't he really ask where or what or anything. So I didn't really know until we were all sitting in the theater watching it and it came on and my song was like the title song and that was really amazing. It was a dream come true. So and also that's opened so many doors for me as as well to do other movies, uh, music for other movies that I've been doing. Uh, you know, Randy really gave me my chance at that, so um, I'm really grateful for that. So, a caveat to that story, I always crack up because we have Tuesday's great song. It's like, anytime you hear that song, that's like the opening of the movie. That's like, even for us, you hear that song. And, but on the soundtrack, none of the none of the songs on the soundtrack are in the movie. <laughs> I don't know if it's, I've signed a few soundtracks and they're really cool because they're original, but none of those songs are in any of the cool parts of the movie. 
if you notice. I don't know if you guys ever had the soundtrack, but the soundtrack from my current Elm Street sucks. Well, the title song is not on it. Like, yeah, it's pretty weird. They didn't want to pay me. That was Drama the Rama song that his scene is in is not on there. Uh, it's just like, like I, I saw it today, I was like, are any of these songs even in the movie? <laughs> Did the Sinead O'Connor song make it in? Nope. Nope. <laughs> You can, well, it's, they don't. They don't want to pay her either. Well, that's what it was. Yeah, that's one of the things about you talking about the like the idea of like knowing how big this was. I don't think even New Line really. I mean, they knew it was popular, but I don't think they knew that people were going to be watching it so closely, so deeply, 20, 30 years later. There was re a real sense of we are Nightmare Three was big. We are capitalizing on this. We are going to make this fast, and we are you know and. Patient O'Connor an extra three grand for her son? No. They, were, they, they paid us, well, me, they paid uh, yeah. the least amount they could pay. No, I meant, I meant that because three was big and there was a, there was huh. a, three was big and there was a sense that New Line, I felt with New Sniper 4, like New Line very much knew they had a commercial property and they were moving it out fast because they did, they wanted to capitalize on whatever heat came from three. I know that we're in four. Well, then they say, sold the <laughs> Are you sure? Yes. Wait. Are you? No. You're definitely Tuesday. Yeah. You're yeah, definitely. Yeah. We're in four. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Do we have another question? Yeah, right here. I would like to know what is your personal favorite, besides your own, your personal favorite death in the series. Personal favorite death in the series. So all of them. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 Personal favorite death in the series. So all of the Elm Street films. Okay. What's your personal favorite death in all of the Elm Street franchise? Tina's. 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 Yeah. Tina's. Yeah. 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 I like uh, Brooke Thies and on the way for Brooke Thies when she turns into Brooke Thies is pretty awesome. Yeah, that's yeah. a great one. That, yeah, where, 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 where's Brooke? Yeah. Who should she, she should be there. She's fun scene. Copper scene is pretty cool. She's making a lot of money in Beverly Hills. <laughs> oh, no, no, no. She's, but she has family and kids. And stuff. Oh, yes. Yes, she's a drama. Yeah, right here. Will you listen to my demo? Yeah! Bring it up! Bring it up! Oh, we'll it. What's the name of the band? I did, but I sold it because I was so broke. <laughs> I have a stupid Letterman's jacket that's out there on eBay and I can't afford it now. <laughs> no, There's a Dan suit from my when I can morph into a motorcycle and I let it go and now it's out there. It's a the Letterman's jacket and the, the, I just, whatever, I should have never sold it, but yeah, it's out there. I should have kept it. I don't think we will. That's like Raging Bull. Actually, people that, uh, you know what I really love to see is when, when people that love the movie, they come to our tables and they bring actual pieces of the set or, you know, things like that, which we were, I was too stupid. Yeah, I, 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 think, I think we didn't know to ask. Did we keep, keep this? We didn't know to ask even, you know, so. I don't think we knew to keep our stuff, you know what I mean? It was yeah. just, we didn't think that it was going to be like this, and so we didn't keep anything. I'm curious though, has that made you into kleptomaniacs on all subsequent films? Because it has me. I have stuff from films that nobody cares about. Just filling the closets because I didn't grab anything from my parents. Well, it's interesting. My mom was the klepto. Oh, well, she was great. And um, I didn't know it until she passed away about four years ago. And I found a box, maybe several of all the things I did from the time I was five years old up until about 25. And she kept every, I mean, every call sheet, any type of notice, press notice. So I actually, from Nightmare, have the original script. Which you can get at her table for 40 dollars. It's already sold out, oh. so sorry. It's gone. <laughs> but I, I had it um, up for some more next time. But I keep thinking I need to bring more of them out. Auntie up, 10 more, 10 more, and then they go. So thank you guys. But it's the original script. Then in there, she also had the day one of our 40-day shoot call sheet. And it has all of us on it, what time we're supposed to be there, what we're wearing, There's what props are in there. There's a coffee statement. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's a script. I like a coffee statement. Yeah, absolutely. 
And then it also has the Rogers and Cohen's, um, who was the public publicity agent that pumped out all of our. Yeah, so they they picked me up as well afterwards. Yeah. Yeah, we went there, the Rogers and Cohen's. So anyway, they have every write up from Granny Home to you to Andros, and I have copies, any other coffee stain copies of all of this. and. Uh, even from shows I did from Different World, the one thing I wanted the most, and they gave us a Nightmare on Elm Street jacket, source of it, but we all have our name with this really cool Nightmare on the back. It's a leather, you know, it's a leather sleeve. What is that? Like a letterman's jacket, right? And so we all got one. Somehow, Andros didn't get one. I don't know why I don't want to go there now. But I still have that jacket. I know why. I didn't get one. <laughs> you didn't? My, I think I was, I don't know, I was filming when the you had to fill out the order form. <laughs> and then what happened though is they gave me the doll, the my replica, my son. And I was so terrified of dolls my whole life and clowns. I just never liked them. Sorry, guy. It's okay. I'm just saying. I see a clown here. I like, look a little bit offensive. So I was the doll, and my mom was like, just bring it home. I'll keep it. And that's the one thing I wish I could have really held on to. It just allowed her to keep it. But I was such, you know, 19, 18 year old, like, I say, no, mom, I got this. And meanwhile, she had me my whole life. So I, I, that's I it. used to have for years. I don't know where somebody probably has it, but for years I had. You know, like when I said when we get these body molds made. I had two of them that were when I get in a car crash. It's me with my mouth open as, as I go into a crash. So I had that in my house for years. So whoever ended up with it, it's out there somewhere. <laughs> we'll sign it. Yeah, it's great back there. Right, uh, what advice do you give to somebody who's trying to break into this business? Break out. What advice would you give to someone who's trying to break into the business? I oh my god, I I this so day and age, I, mm, run the other way. <laughs> I, you know, now that we have social media as present, it's just a just whole different game. You, you know, become an influencer first, and then you can get a role. Okay, <laughs> hey, I mean, this is where social media has such an impact, even on Hollywood. Um, our agents and casting directors, they actually look to see how many followers this particular actress has. Do we want to see them or not, based on followers? Instead of auditions, it's crazy. Maybe, she's right. I think it's you have to. Very I, think, disappointing. I, I, I would tell you just to keep trying. If you want to be an actor, go to yeah. Los Angeles or New York City and try to get into the business. I, I mean, know you, you might get lucky. And, and create social media is going to influence you. It may or may in not. In a good way. It may or may not. Don't want to get all those. Yeah, dollars. and just and try to create your own stuff because yes. that's really important. Yeah. If, you, if you want to do something, uh, you know, a project, or you want to act in something, and you want to play a certain character, whatever you want to do, I think creating your own stuff really helps. Because it, it, not to, but to caveat off what Lisa said, because of social media and all that, a lot of the stuff is crap. They're not good actors. They're people who film themselves and never went through the work that we had to do to literally go to auditions, print up headshots, well, drive around training and, and, and learn how to do That's what I think. Do theater. Actors. And I think anyone, that, if you want to try that, then go for it. Do that. Go for it. But relying on getting hits from Instagram, you probably you probably suck. You probably a terrible actor. I'm gonna be honest. <laughs> <laughs> okay. You know, do theater, go see theater, observe, read film scripts, see films, you know, just totally expose yourself, immerse yourself. And you want to make sure this is something you really want to do, too, because you might go, gosh, I really don't like being in front of the camera. I don't like it, you know. So I did that at 27. I was like, I'm done. And then I started producing and writing directors. No, I wasn't too done, but there's a point where you kind of just say, okay, I, 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 I love this and this is what I do. Um, then I wanted to expand a little bit more on it. I think, you know, a really great example is Andros has this amazing script that him and his partner wrote. And um, we all had an opportunity to maybe play in it. And I think if any of you guys really just kind of follow his, right now what's going on with Andros, he has some really incredible um, cutting edge um, stuff going on right now. And uh, hopefully the script will uh, come to fruition and uh, we'll all be able to play again.
It would be fun. Uh, yeah, actually, there's a there's a there's a website where you can sign up for the mailing list. It's going to be it's called the, the Vampire Conspiracy. You got to serve somebody. And uh, yeah, if you sign up, you'll find out you'll you'll get notices about when. Uh, Shameless exactly. plug. That's a movie. That well, we're yeah, we're all. Well, it's, 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 I, if we're going to plug to anybody, I think if this is the room of people who are going to care about all of us getting yeah, together, exactly. check out our new movie. <laughs> Thank you very much, Troy. Very nice of you. Uh, yes, and the, the the director writer is a guy named Mark Morgenstern. He's very cool. So. All right. Okay. Other questions? Yeah. Are you here? Yes. Um, I wanted to know when Facebook is going to be part of the Did they plan for Alice to evolve from four to five? The way she was very meek at first. Yeah. She was kick ass and fine. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the, the, no, there was no plan. I, you know, I, I had relatively very few credits. Got in that Nightmare on Elm Street. Um, the script is written beautifully. I think in Nightmare Four. I mean, it's just this beautiful character arc for you know Alice to evolve from. Yeah, Wallflower Girl to you know kick ass. You know. Uh, which is an app performer is like a dream role to play, definitely. Um, so I think what happened with Five Two is the phenomenal success of Four, because and Rodney Eastman will argue about this all the time. Which one made more, Three or Four? I believe it's been turned Four made more in the box office, whatever. Um, but the phenomenal, so they decided to bring Alice's character back for Five. Now, of course, Four and Five is a completely different vibe. I mean, five is uh, very much, um, yeah, Alice is now has her strength, and she's got to fight for her child. But it's a very, five deals with when you look at it. It was a brave little film because it had to deal with all of these different kinds of social issues. Let's see, we've got abortion, we have teen pregnancy, we have adoption, we have, um, oh, we have anorexia, too. Uh, we have drinking and driving. We have, I mean, it's like so much packed in that film. Um, I still love both of them for different reasons, you know? But um, I think it was because of the success of four. And then five did not do nearly as well. It was kind of like when I started plummeting down. But I don't care. I love doing the role of Alice. I'll do it again any day. You were my favorite. Uh, right on. You know, I'm really glad you said it's your favorite because I think over time, it's now been 31 years since that film came out, I have a lot more people that are expressing to them that five is their favorite because I think it was just so snug back then. It was just too much. And now there's actually an appreciation for the subject matter that was coming up in that film. So. <laughs> we got time for one more question, and I'll go with the girl with the red feather in her hair because it sounds poetic. Thank you. Uh -huh. Did any of you ever grow to resent your character or feeling typecast? Any Did you ever grow to resent your character or feel like you were typecast? Definitely not. I didn't. I, I, I played did. the same dude in like every role. <laughs> <laughs> you, know what, you know what the name of his yeah. character is in The Vampire Conspiracy? Damn. No, I've never been tight. I, 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 every, I, every role I've done is different, you know, different hair color or makeup or, or clothing or to look heavier, thinner, whatever. Um, that's just why I think they don't get recognized really. I get more like, can I go to college with you? You know, uh, I've seriously played from nuns to prostitutes. So, which is cool. I, I, to answer your question, I mean, I don't know I, to myself because I'm not sure I got cast as a lot of the same dude, just, but at least I fit into a character. Do you know what I mean? Like, it's hard to be, they, they're, they're going to need a character, so for an actor, you want to be a character. That's why, so if I was typecast as the hunky jock dude, I, would, I was like, okay, cool. And, you know, I was like, at least it's a character, so. Yeah. I mean, when people say that, like, oh, were you typecast or something, it's like, I hope so. I'd love to be able to say that, you know? Yeah, yeah I was typecast when I did that series. I live in a different zip code. Because I made money. <laughs> but anyhow, no, I, I, I just, it would be nice to be able to, to say that, though. Like, yeah, I, mean, I need to break out of these roles I keep getting. Yeah, that would be really good. I think also, it's funny for me, was in Nightmare on Elm Street, I sort of played like the essential good girl next door kind of thing. And then from that on, every role that I got after that was always the bad girl. <laughs> it was always like the, the wicked one or something. The, the, you know, the best friend to the real sweet girl. I was like the bad one that didn't hang out with her or something. It was, it was really weird. Yeah. Uh, I think um, my then teenage daughter would have testified to the fact that I was definitely bitch mom. <laughs> Did you ever say, on delay, on delay? 
Okay, well we are just about out of time guys, so please give our panelists